Hi. In this video, I'll be explaining the min-cost flow problem and going through two different ways of solving it. We'll begin with an algorithmic approach and then take a look at an integer programming formulation of the problem. So there's some prerequisite material before we start. In order to understand the way we solve the problem, you should have a working understanding of the maximum flow problem. So please either watch the video on solving the maximum flow problem using the Ford Focus and Algorithm if you haven't done so already, linked in the description, or review some material online, so Wikipedia or somewhere else. You should also be familiar with some basic mathematical symbols and notation, which will make it easier to follow along. So feel free to pause at any time to look up what a symbol means if you haven't seen it before. So what is the min cost flow problem anyway? Well, the min cost flow problem is, like the max flow problem, a graph flow optimization problem. In this problem, each node has a supply or demand given by the same parameter. Each edge has some capacity, which is greater than zero, and the cost of shipping one unit of flow along the edge. We want to send flow through the graph from the supply node to the demand node so that all the demands are satisfied and the capacity along any given edge is not exceeded. Furthermore, what we want to do in this manner is minimize the total cost of flow. Right? So min cost flow problem, minimize the total cost of the flow. Also note that we can actually say without loss of generality that all edges have capacities greater than zero, as any edge with capacity zero doesn't need to be displayed in the graph and it will never be used because we can't send any flow through it. So let's go through some similarities and differences between the MCF problem and the max flow problem. So let's start with the differences. In MCF, we work with supply and demand built into the nodes themselves, while in max flow, the supply and demand are unbounded and take the form of a source and a sink. You may remember from the max flow video, we can send as much flow as possible through, and that's the idea. We want to send as much flow as possible, right? But in MCF problem, we just have these limited amounts of supply and demand. And because of that, it's possible that it doesn't have a feasible solution, right? Maybe there's not enough supply to meet demand. Maybe there's not enough demand, or there's too much demand, and or maybe there's too much supply, there's, there's, there's more supply than we need, right? Um, it's a little bit more complicated. In terms of similarities, both are graphical flow-related optimization problems, and both have edges with capacities. So now let's get into the mathematical formulation of the MCF. So we start with a graph G, which has nodes and edges, and we have nodes I in the node set N with supply or demand S of I. We say that a node has a supply of S of I if S of I is greater than zero, and we say that a node has a demand of S of I if S of I is less than zero. Edges I, J in the edge set E with capacities U sub I J greater than zero, and also costs C sub I J greater than or equal to zero are also in the graph. And we also have flows F I, J such that U I, J is greater than or equal to that flow f i comma j which is greater than or equal to zero so flows can be no more than the capacity and they can be no less than zero additional constraints on the flow follow on the next slide so here are some more constraints flows also have to obey these constraints right so for each node i we have this constraint regarding the supply the flow in and the flow out right so here you can see my mouse here is the flow in, right? And here, over here on the left, is the flow out. Now, the sum of the flow out of the node minus the sum of the flow into the node is equal to the supply or demand for each of the nodes, right? So how is this going to work? Well, basically, we have flow that goes through the nodes, very, very much similarly to the max flow problem, right? We have flow that starts from some edge that leads into the node, and exits that node afterwards, right? And the sum of those flows, right? In the max flow problem, we had them be equal, right? So flow in equals flow out. Now, in this case, we don't have that, right? In the max flow problem, this would have been zero over here. This S of I would have been zero. But in the max, but in the min cost flow problem, we have this S of I here instead. Basically, the S of I acts like an offset to that flow. As the flow goes through, we either add the supply to it or this, we're subtract the demand from it, right? Say we have a flow of five is the sum of the flows going into some node, and that node has demand three, right? Then as that flow goes through, we're taking our demand out of that, right? We demand three, so we're going to take three, and now there's only two left that can leave. That's the main idea here. One other very important thing to note, and I think I noted this before, but the MCF is not always solvable, right? 
Since we get all our demands and supplies from the inputs of the problem rather than being given these unbounded amounts, like from nodes S and T, um, from the supply and demand from these, these source and sync nodes, it's possible that we don't have enough supply to meet demand or that we have more supply than demand, right? We can check if this is the case by very simply looking at the value of this sum here, right? Now, we look at the sum of all the supply demand values over all the nodes. Now, if there's more supply than demand, it'll be greater than zero. If there's less supply than demand, or you know, there's more demand than supply, then it'll be less than zero. If it's equal to zero, then at least in this metric, the problem is balanced, right? We have a balanced supply and demand, which is required. We also don't know whether it's possible to have the desired flow constraint satisfied even if the supplies and demands are balanced, right? As an example, say that you have some graph and maybe the supply is two and the demand is negative two. Okay, um, but what about the capacities on the edges? What about the cost of those edges? Well, the costs we don't really care about, right? Because all we really need about for feasibility is that there is a way to get flows through even if the cost is infinity, still doesn't matter for us. Um, you know, it's not good, but still doesn't matter. Um, we might just have capacities be zero for all the edges in the graph. What then, right? Then it's still not satisfied even if the supplies and demands are balanced, right? So we can check for this part of the feasibility by rewriting the problem as a max flow problem. Um, the example that I gave is just a, a simple example, but it's possible that in more complex ways, um, the flows would not be satisfiable. So we check this by rewriting it as an max flow problem, right? We need to make sure it satisfies the input requirements for a max flow first, though. We, make, we need to make sure that it has a source node S and a sync node T. We need to make sure that the graph doesn't have supplies or demands in it, and also costs are not relevant in the max flow problem either. So to formulate this a little bit more concretely, um, we begin by creating a new graph G prime with nodes N prime and edges E prime, where N prime is this union of the original node set n and the set of nodes s and t, right? So we're creating these nodes s and t and we're adding them to our node set. That's pretty easy. We define e prime to be the union of e, the original edge set, with the following sets. So we have s and t. s is the set of edges that leaves the node s and goes to each node that has a positive supply demand value, right? So s of i is greater than zero. This means that the node has a supply and not a demand. Similarly, T is a set of edges that leave nodes with demand and go to little t, right? So we, we make these edges for each node based on whether they have supply or demand. If they have supply, then we'll have an edge from S that goes to them. And if they have demand, we'll have an edge that goes from them to T. So that is E prime is the union of E, of S, and of T. And we'll also define the capacities of these new edges in S and T as either the supply or the negation of the demand. So if the node has a supply, then we can leave it as it is, right? Because it's already positive. If it's a demand, then we know it's negative, right? But we can't have a negative capacity, can't send a negative flow through an arc. So we'll negate that, right? This is effectively taking the absolute value because it's negative, so we're just making it positive. So with all this incorporated into our new graph G prime, G prime is then an input to the max flow problem. After rewriting the problem as a max flow instance, we solve the newly created instance. If the value that we obtain in our, as our max flow is equal to the sum of all the supplies or of all the demands, then we know that our original MCF problem was feasible. Otherwise, the MCF problem was not feasible. When we finished solving the max flow problem, if the flow value is equal to this sum of supplies or sum of demands as required, then we can obtain an initial feasible solution to our MCF problem from this max flow solution. To illustrate the process in example, I'll, I'll show an example. So here's an example MCF problem. Um, it's just a graph, right? Um, inside each of the nodes, we have the supply or demand, the, the S of I, right? Um, and then along the edges, we have these tuples, right? So let's look at the top edge as an example. In this top edge, we have two and three inside the tuple. 
And this means that the cost per unit of flow sent, the cost, right, is two, and the capacity, the number of units of flow that we can send through it is three, right? And this is the same. So, you know, from between these two nodes, we have the cost is two, and we can send four units of flow through, etc. Now, here's a transformed version as a max flow problem, right? We have these new nodes, S over here and T over here, with these values three, which you can see corresponds to this three here, six, which corresponds to the six here, and four, which corresponds to the four here, right? From S to those nodes, it's the actual supply that becomes the capacity. And here, the nodes leading into T, we can see it's the negation of the demand, right? So these, these three nodes had demands because they were negative, and the capacity from this node with negative two to T is two. From here, negative eight to T is eight, and from negative three to T is three. All right? Uh, feel free to pause the video and go back and forth and, and see how we basically got this new graph. And now we've solved the Maxwell problem, right? So you can, maybe you want to think of it as we used Ford Fulkerson to do this, um, and we just got lucky. We didn't have to do any residual graphs or anything. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, you should be able to see this graph and just, just look at it and say like, oh, I see, you know, three out of three, three out of three, two out of two. Our, our min cut here is the same as actually our min cut over here, which is just because of the way that our problem is formulated. Um, and it's, yeah, so it works, right? And now in this slide, we've removed the added nodes S and T and the edges that came with them. And we've also added the costs back in. And it looks like this is a feasible solution to the min cost flow problem. So feel free to pause the video and check on your own that this is actually feasible um, using these new numbers here and the supplies and demands. So solving this max flow instance gives us a flow of 13. This is easy to see even without the understanding of the max flow FF algorithm. Um, since 13 is the same as the supply, which is also the same as the demand, we know that the MCF problem is feasible. And we can use this max flow solution as a starting point for our algorithm for solving the MCF problem, as we know that it contains an initial feasible solution. So the way that we're going to start solving this MCF problem is with the cycle canceling algorithm. So the cycle canceling algorithm is one of many, many ways to solve the min cost flow problem. And it's somewhat similar to the Ford Fulkerson algorithm um, for solving max flow in that it involves this repeated revision of an initial feasible solution with the guidance of a residual graph. Um, and I'll, I'll use a smaller example as I go through this algorithm because residual graphs are pretty bulky. I mean, they have extra nodes going either way and then the, the edges are curvy and stuff and it, it'll use up a lot of space. And I don't have too much space in the slide. So let's start with an overview of this algorithm. So after finding our initial feasible flow using the max flow conversion, we iteratively alter the flow until we obtain the optimal solution. So in each iteration, we first build the residual graph, and then we check if there is some negative cost cycle in the residual graph that we can exploit. And if there is such a cycle, then what we do is we find the maximum amount of flow that we can send through this cost cycle, right? And we do that by sending, seeing what the min capacity is. Um, and then we add this amount of capacity. Um, we say that we're going to send through there that amount of capacity. So we add that to all the forward edges and we subtract it from all the backwards edges. And we just keep doing this. And if there isn't any cycle left, then we stop and we're done and the algorithm is terminated. So here is our example. Um, already marked on the graph are the flows from the max flow initial feasible solution. Right, so we already know that this is feasible. Um, and we're using a different notation here. The tuples above each of the edges are, now this corresponds to cost again, but this five out of five here for this example top edge um, corresponds to five out of five flow units being sent, right? So we're sending five flow units and the capacity is also five flow units, which means that we can't send any more through it, right? So now this is the residual graph. We've added in the backwards edges marked in blue 
and note that the cost of going along a backwards edge in the residual graph is the negation of the cost of going forward along that edge, which should be pretty intuitive, right? So here, this cost was two to go from this node here, this one marked with a three to this one marked with a negative six. And the cost of going backwards along that is negative two, right? Should, should make sense. Um, and now the, we're also changing the notation again here. Um, because there's no reason to say like how many units we're sending is the residual graph is all about how many units we can still send, right? So note that in the original one, it was, um, let's just go back one slide. We could see this was a forward edge, right? And now it's a backwards edge, right? Because we can't send any more forward. We can send everything backwards, right? We can send five units of flow backwards at a cost of zero because zero is the negation of zero. Right? So I've highlighted the negative cost cycle that was in this graph, in this residual graph, in red. So it's a little bit easier to see. Um, and why is this a negative cost cycle? Well, let's look at it, right? So this has a cost of 0. This has a cost of 4. This is a cost of negative 8. And this is a cost of 2. So if you add all those together, you get negative 2, which is below 0. So it's a negative cost cycle, right? Now remember, what are we going to do with this negative cost cycle? Well, we're going to exploit it to the best of our ability, right? So what are the capacities here? Well, we see 5, we see 2, 2, 2. OK, so we have 2, 2, 2, and 5. What's the minimum of those? Well, it's 2, right? So we're going to send 2 units along this cycle here, right? Which means that we're going to basically zero out this cycle and that we won't be able to send any more along the cycle after we do this because we'll be at capacity for the minimum capacity edge on the cycle right and now let's take a look at what that ends up giving us for our next residual graph so in this next residual graph right we we've increased our flow on the edges by the but by two right which is the minimum of two 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 and five um, and we've decreased flow on the backwards edges by that same amount um, and now we have these extra edges, or these new edges, in, I should say, in green, which have been added to our residual graph as a result of that adding, subtracting, etc. right? Now we can send two units of flow forwards on this edge still, right? Remember, we could, before we could only send five units backwards. Now we can only send three units backwards, right? Um, yeah, it's, it should be pretty, it should, it should make sense. Since there are no more negative cost cycles in the residual graph, we can now update the original graph based on these changes. And here's the updated graph, which we now know to be the optimal solution. The original graph had a total cost of 18, while this one has a total cost of 14, which is better. Now to reiterate, here is the cycle canceling summary, right? So first we check feasibility, right? We check that the supplies and demands are balanced by summing the supplies slash demands S of i for all nodes i. And then we convert it to a max flow problem to further ensure that the problem is feasible. We find this initial feasible flow using the max flow solution. And we repeat this procedure of building a residual graph, checking for negative cost cycles, adding the maximum capacity of any negative cost cycles that we find, and once there are no more negative cost cycles left, we finish the algorithm and we're done and we have an optimal solution. OK, so with that out of the way, now let's turn to our second way of solving the MCF problem. So we can also formulate the MCF problem as a integer linear program, or ILP, which can be solved using the simplex algorithm branch and bound, et cetera, et cetera, you know, branch and cut, uh, all sorts of different methods. Uh, many solvers exist for ILPs, including Cplex and Gurobi. But these tend to be like super expensive. Um, so, you know, this is something that you'd see in academia probably a lot more than, you know, at your place of work, unless your work is willing to shell out like 200 grand for some software package like this. Um, the main benefit of the ILP formulation is that it's very concise. So the entire problem can be described very, very concisely um, in a couple constraints, leaving most of the work to the solver itself. So, Let's start with integer program formulation. Um, we'll begin with the objective, right? So the objective is to minimize cost. 
right? That's part of the problem, minimum cost flow. Um, and so what is the cost here? Well, it's the cost of all the flows, right? So each edge has a cost, C of E, each edge E has a cost C of E. And then the amount of flow that we send along that edge will get multiplied by that cost to get the total cost of the flow that we're sending along that edge. Now, since we summed this over all edges, we get the total cost overall of the set of flows that we've chosen in our solution, all right? And we're choosing to minimize this. Next, we have some constraints, right? So this is basically just rewriting the constraints that we already saw earlier in the video, um, except now we have these for all, right? Because this is going to be very useful for when we actually formulate this and write it up um, and present it to the solver. So again, we have the supply and demand constraints. This is basically exactly the same as we saw before. Um, the edge capacities are satisfied, and the flows on each edge are greater than or equal to zero, right? So this is basically just split up the constraint into two different ones. Um, you know, just making sure that our flows in between are in between zero and the maximum capacity on each edge. So the way that I'm gonna write this solution up is using Groovy Pi. Um, Groovy Pi is this Python front end to Groovy, which is one of the solvers that we mentioned before. Um, and yeah, so we'll just take a look at that. And I don't guarantee that this code is completely correct, although you know it does solve our example correctly. Um, and also, you know what, you should probably write your own implementation as like a learning exercise or something. It's it's pretty fun to do. It can be a little bit frustrating, you know, if the the constraints seem right, but then they're they're not right. Anyway, um, I've made the code available at a link in the video description, um, or you know, it's much better than like pausing the video and retyping it yourself. Um, it's a Jupyter notebook, so it should be easy to scroll through, and uh, I'll put it on GitHub or something. All right, so here we are in the Jupyter notebook, um, and I'll just go through, kind of just scroll through here really quick, and um, kind of talk through it. Here are the imports. We have Groovy Pi. We have time, which we're just using a time the total amount of time that it takes. Um, we have our input data, right? We have four nodes, and we have these edges. Um, and costs on those edges, capacities on those edges, and a supply or demand for each of those edges. I'm just saying supply here because it's intuitive. All right, so here we have our variable f. We have, um, we have the constraint for the sum of in and out, having this relationship with the amount of supply at each node. And we have the edge flows with regard to capacities, right? So the flows need to be less than or equal to the capacities, and the flows need to be greater than or equal to zero for each edge, right? We set the objective to the cost times the flow over all edges, and then we optimize it. And after that, what we get is this output, right? So I set I set Groovy to the maximum output, so you can kind of see a little bit into what it does if you're interested in that. Um, but what we really care about is right here, so this optimal objective, right? 1.4 times 10 to the 1, so 14. Right, which is the exact same objective that we found in our solution. And after it's done, what we can do is we can take a look at what each variable value is right, in our optimal solution. Um, and we see the flow from 0 to 1 was 3, the flow from 0 to 3 was 2, from 2 to 1 was 3, and from 2 to 3 was 0. So let's just go back and verify that that was actually the case, although it is, but let's just take a look. All right, so we're back at our example, and yes, it is the case, right? So from 0 to 1, it was 3. From 0 to 3, it was 2. From 2 to 1, it was 3. And from 2 to 3, it was 0. So yeah, we already saw this, but our results are correct. And yeah, and it took you know 0 seconds, of course, right? It's super fast. The instance is very small. There are very few constraints, so not that bad. And that's it. So thanks for watching the video. Um, this idea came from a comment on the Ford Fulkerson Max Flow video. Um, thank you to the commenter for that idea. And also, I just want to say these slides are largely based on lecture notes from a course that I took in fall 2021 at Cornell, ORI 4330, which was talked by uh, Octai Gunluk. And the example for the cycle of canceling algorithm, the one with only the four nodes, is drawn directly from those notes. So thank you very much for that. Although the GroupyPy implementation of MCF is completely my own. So, you know, again, take that with whatever 
heaping of salt that you want to. And that's it. And yeah, see you next time.